And so Jesus gives them a really simple answer that, that he, he teaches in parables so that the ones who understand get it and the ones who don't, don't, right? Uh, if you don't know what he's talking about, you really just kind of go, okay, that was an interesting story, Jesus. A guy throws a net in the water, catches some fish, he separates the good from the bad. Okay. Sounds good. You keep the good ones, you throw out the bad ones. It's pretty simple. But then he starts to unpack it, and Jesus starts to say, this is what this parable is about, this, the soils. So look at verse 11 with me. So this is Jesus speaking. He says, in the meaning of this parable, the seed is the word of God, and those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So think about that. There's, there's a group of people that hear the word of God, and it might be very interesting to them, but it just never, never fits. It never takes root in their life. Do you know some folks like that? You know they've heard, you know they've had access to the word of God, but for some reason it doesn't take root inside them. And then he continues, verse 13. Um, Those that are on the rock, this is the seeds that landed on the rock, are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. This one's a little different. So if the, the, the Matthew version of this story says the, seed, the birds come and take some of that first, the first type. And then this one, you've got that it takes root, but it, it doesn't last. It still burns up and gets scorched by the sun. And then you've got this third type. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on, on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And they do not mature. Think about that one. This one grows into a fully formed plant, but it never bears fruit. What do you do with the plant that doesn't bear fruit? Now we're back to the fishing story. You separate the good ones from the bad ones, right? Like this is, if you have an orange tree, have you guys ever been to the Rio Grande Valley? I lived there for 10 years and there's oranges and there's grapefruits. And, uh, and you drive past these orchards, and, and in harvest season, you know, there's just so many oranges. Do you guys know how many oranges come off of one tree? Here's a better question. How many seeds come out of one tree? Thousands. I have no idea, by the way. <laughs> one of you guys who are A&M grads, you guys should tell me, like, hey, I've got some of those guys like, oh, hey, Chad, that's like 600 oranges per tree. You should know that. Eight seeds per orange, 24,000. Anyway, all of those things. But listen, this is a really important thing. If you have an orange tree and you've waited and it's ready and there's no oranges, what are you going to do with it? I'll tell you what they do in the valley. They cut it off and they put another orange in the same stalk. (laughs) They don't want it to grow from the roots. They cut it off and they graft in a new one because the new ones will continue to get the nutrients from the root system that's already developed and it'll it'll go faster. It seems kind of brutal for the tree, but... That's exactly what they do. They cut it off and put another one in its place. So then look at this fourth type. But the soil, the seed on the good soil, it stands for those who with a noble and good heart hear the word of God, they retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. If you look at his verse, the, the verse up above, it says a hundred times more than what was sown. This is a really interesting parable. I think all of us are very familiar with the people that hear the word of God and never respond. And some of us know of folks who've, who've heard the word of God and they respond and it just kind of fades from their life. And you wonder if they're saved or did they ever really get saved? Did they ever give their heart? You don't really know. You, you pray and ask that God would, would call them back and that they would get redeemed and that their lives and heart would be sincere. And that, that second soil, but that third soil, that third soil is a really interesting one because I think it defines American Christianity on a really big level. It's people that hear the word of God and they begin to grow. They, they look mature, but they never bear fruit. That's a scary person to me. It's one that looks like they've got it all together, but they never see the gospel flourish in their life. They never thrive with the gospel in their hearts and lives. They never reproduce new believers. They never, they never see the kingdom of God become evident in the people around them. And these kind of parables really stress me out about that. Because these kind of things talk about what happens to those those ones. The the Mark version of this, the same parable says that the the disciples, the the, the workers say, should we go out and collect all of the the wheat and separate the weeds from the wheat? 
Remember that story? And then he says, no, because by doing so, you'll tear up some of the good stuff to get rid of some of the bad stuff. You wait until it matures, until it's fruit bearing, and then you take the fruit first. Like all of these stories, all these metaphors are saying the same thing. That God expects his people to be conduits of his love to the people around them. And those of us who are seeking him and faithful to him bear fruit. And that fruit goes far beyond the way we think about fruit bearing. It's, it's, it's not addition. You bring one or two in. If you had an orange tree that gave you one orange per year, you probably wouldn't be happy with it. This is a multiplication type of effort. This is a thing where one tree bears thousands of seeds. That can do what? What does a seed do? A seed has the power to become another tree that bears thousands. Sometimes we get so interested in the fruit, we forget that the fruit's not the point. The seed is the point, right? If we bear fruit that remains, that's nice, but you want to bear fruit that reproduces. That's what we're we're multiplying, that's what we're asking for. And every disciple, every single follower of Jesus has the capacity, has the calling, and has the capability to follow Jesus and make new disciples. Who do what? They make more disciples. Who do what? (laughs) They make more disciples. And so over and over and over again, when you see these parables, you find this really clear tool that Jesus is telling the people who are following him that it's not just for you. It's for those who will come to faith through you and those who will come to faith through them. And on and on and on until you get to us 2,000 years later and the gospel has taken root in our hearts. I always find it as an interesting thing. You know, when Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all the nations, so I baptize, all that kind of stuff, you see the whole, the whole task. We're part of those nations, right? Everyone knows that. But you think about in Acts 1, 8, where he says, go, um, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. If you look at a map and you start in Jerusalem, do you know where the ends of the earth are? Bernie, Texas is pretty, pretty close. If you put yourself there in Jerusalem, you drive halfway around the world to get to here. We talk about Timbuktu. It's like the, if you go straight through the earth to the other side, like Timbuktu, uh, Africa is one of those places. But, but from Jerusalem, we're almost the very ends of the earth. And we'll look at this. We get to gather with freedom and love Jesus. And we have this incredible opportunity to love him freely and to share him with those around us. And what a better task for us than to go and make disciples of all the nations. So when you hear me talking about fishing, throwing out a net or throwing out a hook, I'm not talking about fish as much as I like to fish for real fish. Over and over and over again, I'm praying that God would help us fish for men and women, that they'll come to faith, that they'll be fruit-bearing Christians, bearing a hundred, a thousand-fold. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray, God, that you would help us to be the seed sower that goes out with the seed of the gospel and that we share it with those that we know and see and love. God, we pray that we'll be like those fishermen who throw their nets out and that, God, that we bring in a harvest. God, we know that not all of them will follow you, but, God, we want to give them all an option. Lord, we pray that here in Bernie, Texas, that your light and life will flow through us to the world around us. Use us for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, for those of you who are not in the choir, we have a gospel conversations training up, uh, training coming up on May 22nd. It's a Wednesday night in two weeks. Uh, it'll go from 6 to 9 o'clock, and we'll just go through some basic tools. I know, three whole hours, Dan. Three hours, bud, but it'll be good. We're going to teach you guys how to share your faith with your friends and how to have regular conversations with those who are close to, close to you but far from God.